Hello, and welcome to Nourishment at Noon. My name is Chanson Esparza, and I'm one of the pastors at Manchuck United Methodist Church, and today is Wednesday, May 27th. Now, Wednesday is not my day to do Nourishment at Noon. That is usually David. Pastor David is usually here, and so I am sorry if you are disappointed if you came here thinking you were going to see David, but hopefully I can share something that you will appreciate too. Um, usually I am on Fridays, and I, and I bring along my son, August, and we'll come back Friday. Um, I just decided today didn't need him. <laughs> he was yawning a lot last Friday, and I was like, I think I'll take a day without him. Now that I got an extra day, Pastor David is taking a few days off um, for a scheduled little rest. Uh, he and Pam, I think they celebrated their anniversary. I'm not sure if this was actually an anniversary trip or just a, I need a few days off trip. Um, <laughs> but they're relaxing. And so I hope they're having a really good time. Thank you, Catherine. I see that you say you're not disappointed, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um. I thought today that we could reflect on some scripture together. I was reading a story from Mark 4. And so I'm going to read it with y'all and then make some comments. All right. Turn off my little... I'm using some, some of our technology and our graphics. So you'll have the scripture with me. Okay, I say hi to Jenna and Christine and Edna. So good that y'all are here. All right, let's read scripture together. Okay, Mark 4, 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, this is Jesus saying, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. Where was I? A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Oh, I forgot to give this to y'all earlier too. Nourishment at noon. <laughs> and I see some more people have joined us. I'm so glad you're here. Pat and Diana and Carolyn and Ron and Mary and Susan and and, I, and did I say Christine already? Well, here's some thoughts that I had about that text about Jesus calming the storm. So first of all, I just want to say um, a story of my dad because, I mean, David shared some about his dad on Monday. I'm going to share a little bit about my dad, who's today his 38th anniversary with my mom. They're celebrating as well. <laughs> but my dad is a jokester. He has always told stories and kidded with us. And sometimes when I was growing up, his stories would be so fantastical, but I was gullible. And I would, I would be like, wow. And I was like, are you telling him the truth? And he'd say, yes, yes, of course. And after a while, if you think about it, sometimes I would say, do you promise? Because that was the magic word with my dad. If... He ever said, I promise, he had made a pact with me somewhere along the way that if he said, I promise, then it was definitely the truth. So I would ask him and sometimes he'd try to play it off like, oh, you shouldn't have to ask me about promising it. Why would I lie? Well, I knew that my dad was someone who would never lie to me when he said, I promise. And because I know who my dad is, I don't have to fear that he won't follow through or that he'll trick me. When it comes to that key phrase, my dad is completely trustworthy. So knowing my dad the way that I do takes away my fear. 
And in our story in Mark, we see the disciples at a point in their story when they didn't yet know Jesus. Like there's levels of knowing. And and in Mark, this is only in the fourth chapter. And it had been a, it's a fast paced story beginning with Jesus getting baptized in the Jordan. He's tempted. He calls his disciples. He rebukes demons. He heals the sick and begins a preaching tour. And it's all one chapter. It's really fast. And more of that kind of thing happens up until we get to chapter four. And what I just feel like that text is saying to me today is, and I wrote it out for you, (laughs) fear is calmed when you know God. I would like to have put no in like italics, so like you know God, but the capitalize is all I could do. Fear is calmed when you know God. So I think about it, storms comes. Storms came for the disciples. They come for us. Jesus, right before the story, was preaching near the Sea of Galilee. And the crowds were so huge that he was actually standing in the boat and preaching to them on the beach, on the shore. And he didn't even get off the boat. He was ready to move on. So they just pushed off into the, into the sea. It's a, it's a large freshwater lake. And the Sea of Galilee has all these hills around it. And it is below sea level. And so when there's a quick, a big temperature change, Violent storms can come in with gusts of wind down into the valley. And so this sea was well known for having all of a sudden bad storms. And there were four disciples with Jesus that we know of, at least four of them, that were trained fishermen. And the thing that they probably feared their whole life happened. This great storm arose. Um, The words that are used in the text have like demonic overtones to it. So the waves were beating into the boat and there was just this great force. And so I just think about those first few verses, storms come. And then I was thinking like, do storms come everywhere? And I was thinking about like the driest place on earth. And I looked this up and I Googled there and I found um, a place that some say is the driest place on earth, the Atacama Desert in Chile. Ever heard of it? I hadn't, but they would get maybe 0.6 inches of rain per year, although some even less. And some people live there, and I think that's amazing. But what was more amazing to me is that I saw some some videos and some footage and pictures that just a few years ago, this driest place on earth had this devastating flood. And so the rain poured, and the, the ground is as hard as rock. And so it only was two inches of rain for within 24 hours. And that's what flooded the desert because of that hard rock, unabsorbing ground. The years of rainfall and just several years of, of rainfall in just one day destroyed everything in its path and even killed many people. And so I thought, man, how little rain it takes sometimes to cause a storm in our life. To cause us to feel like we are completely shaken. It could be as little as two inches, but it also could be a lot more. So rain comes, literal and figurative. They're part of this broken world, and Christians face them in the same proportion as non-Christians. Jesus said, here in this world you will have troubles, many trials and sorrows. Um, so reading this text and thinking about these things actually kind of reminds me of like the texts that we've been reading this past month at worship about pain and loss kind of contributes to that. So then the next part of the scripture, I see questions. I see the disciple asking questions in verse 38, it says, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I mean, Okay, they really were in trouble and in danger of, de- of drowning. And Jesus was asleep, which is kind of amazing to think about. Um, but, you know, Jesus is God, and he was secure and sovereign. And why not sleep? 
So what seemed, what, but what it seemed like to the disciples was that he was unaware of their trouble. So they called him teacher, which at this point in the book of Mark, that's really what they, they knew of him. They, he had been teaching and healing people, and they don't yet realize that Jesus really is the Son of God. So they called him teacher, not recognizing more. And they accused him. It wasn't just a question. It was kind of a, an accusation. Um, they resented that they were facing death, and they believed he was indifferent. Now, us today, we sometimes ask questions when we're afraid um, of other people. Like, we ask the questions of other people and God, but like, think about other people. Um, like, a little, a little kid, Jerry, came running into the house playing outside with his friend, and they've been eating a snack on the front porch. And he t told his mom, I accidentally swallowed a watermelon seed, and Johnny says, now I'm going to grow one in my belly. Is that true? Well, this fearful question of a child, seen from the perspective of an adult, can sound ridiculous. Kids ask about the boogeyman. They wonder about monsters under their bed. We see as adults more than what children see. And so their questions can look silly to us. And so sometimes I'm like, well, I wonder what God thinks of our questions. Because God sees so much more than we do. God sees our questions and our doubts. Because doubts about God can emerge in times of crisis. The disciples accused and doubted. But Christians, we are called to not just withstand storms, we're called to be faithful and fearless about the storms. And so I look at the final part of this text from today, Mark 4, in verses 39 and 41, and I see understanding and recognition that can help us overcome fear. Because Jesus, he rebuked the wind and everything stopped. He, he used two imperative words in it's be quiet and be still. And that storm, which represents the powers of chaos and evil, was completely sil silenced, like an exorcism of nature. And in that instant, the disciples' circumstances and perspective were changed. Jesus said, why are you afraid? Now, it's pretty obvious to me why they'd been afraid. I mean, <laughs> the swamping water imminent death, remember? <laughs> but Jesus correlates their fear with a lack of faith. Have you still no faith? He said. So after all the healings and exorcisms and teachings and just knowing me, do you still not know me? Jesus asked them, and apparently they did not. You know, just prior to this story, it mentions that Jesus explained all these things to them, all these things to them privately. They didn't understand the parables, and so um, he was explaining things to them, but they still didn't have faith in his power. And it's like, that kind of sounds like me sometimes. The Bible's been explained to me. I've learned all about God's character. I've been following Jesus, but in the midst of my anxiety... Sometimes I fail to see the bigger picture. Well, the disciples wondered, who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? I mean, the answer is in the story itself. What is uncontrollable to, peop uncontrollable to people is controlled by God. Jesus is the son of God. No one else could have controlled nature like that. Yet the disciples are unable to decipher the significance of his identity. That identity question matters. Who then is this? Now we, when we're reading the story, have insight. We know the end of the story. We know that Jesus triumphs. But not knowing is hard when you're in the midst of it. And the disciples were in the midst of it. Kind of like suspense movies are so sus suspenseful and fearful fear-inducing because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to jump out at you. People are afraid when they don't know. So how do we transcend fear when we don't know? 
The story tells us that we learn not to fear when we recognize who Jesus is. When we recognize that we're loved by the all-powerful God who is with us in the storm. Jesus is the God who says, I'm with you in the storm. Now, can we be like Jesus, who had such assurance that he was serene during a storm? I want to transcend fear like that. And so we just have to get that identity question right. Is Jesus the Son of God? The disciples asked, do you not care that we're perishing? Of course Jesus cared. Jesus was in the boat with them. His life was bound to theirs. And when we bind our lives back to him, our fate and Jesus' fate are one and the same. His triumph is our triumph. Our struggle is his struggle. When we are afraid, we too try to wake up God and get him to take care of us sometimes. But Jesus is already present and concerned even when we don't perceive his care. In Jesus, we have the God of whom all nature obeys, even when it appears that the storms may overwhelm us. I like this quote from Max Lucado. He says, The presence of fear does not mean you have no faith. Fear visits everyone. But make your fear a visitor and not a resident. When fear persists, it's because we forget who God is. The disciples in this point in Mark 4 didn't yet know Jesus is God. They didn't see the extent of his care, that he would die for them. No one could care more. Um, I have one last story to share. So there's this book called Chester's Way. And in it, it's about some mice who are friends. And, and on one page you read this, that once when Wilson accidentally swallowed a watermelon seed and cried, he, it, he was cr- crying because he was afraid that a watermelon plant would grow inside him. Well, Chester then swallowed one too. And he said, don't worry. Now, if you grow a watermelon plant, I'll grow one too. And I think God is like Chester. He gets in the boat with us. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. God is in the boat with us. We have faith in this God who saves us even beyond death. Now, He doesn't save us from physical death. He doesn't prevent all bad things from our path for always. But neither did he spare Jesus. But he did raise Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us. Do you know this God? Know this God? Fear is calmed when you know God. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Fear is present in our current situation, but it's kind of present throughout life no matter what, pandemic or not. It's something we struggle against. And the only true comfort is knowing that God's in the boat with us. So, you are loved. Thank you for being with me, you guys. See you all soon.